Okay, good evening everybody and welcome to Wednesday evening's seminar. Tonight we have Construction Essentials discussing loss, expense and damages and this is with Richard Silver who is the senior partner at Silver Law. Uh, as always, if you have any questions for Richard, please feel free to put them into either the chat box or the Q&A in the bottom <coughs> of the toolbar. And alternatively, if there's something you don't particularly wish to ask in an open forum, please don't hesitate to email Richard directly, richardsilver at silverllp.com. Okay, Richard, I will hand over to you. Take it away. Thank you, Julie. Good evening to all of you. Um, today, we're going to speak about loss and expense and damages. Um, as you will be aware, if you've attended any of my previous seminars, my original background is in construction. Um, I was, amongst other things, a, a chief surveyor or you know, senior surveyor, site surveyor on jobs. And um, it was my view at the time that claims for loss and expense were claims for our profit. It was a way of us trying to seek more money. Um, what we're going to do today is to cover what should actually happen. Um, now, we have a whole variety of contracts out there, and they deal with the issue of money associated with delay in different ways. Most, but not all, contracts provide for a date for completion. And if the contractor fails to meet by meet that completion date, quite often the contract will provide for liquidated damages. In other words, if the contractor fails to complete on time and cannot claim any extension of time, the employer is entitled to the amount stipulated in the contract for the delay. So the liquidated damages might be, by way of example, £5,000 per week or part thereof. So it's very simple for the employing party to simply say, you finish six weeks late, the damages are £5,000 per week, six times five is 30,000. Please send me a cheque for 30,000 or possibly set off that amount against other amounts due. Now it is possible that either the contract doesn't provide for liquidated damages, or because of problems with time at large and damages at large, the provisions in the contract have failed and therefore the employer may be forced to seek to recover general damages. It's been said in case law, albeit a bitter, in other words, it wasn't actually the judge's ruling that where a contract provides amount for liquidated damages of let's say 5,000 pounds per week or part thereof, the employer cannot recover a sum greater than that. But the big problem for the employer is that they have to prove their loss. That's why many employers include liquidated damages because it is so much easier. Now, as far as the contractor is concerned, if they have an obligation to complete by a completion date and they're prevented by the employer, the contract must provide for extensions of time. If it doesn't, and the contractor is so delayed by the employer, time and damages are rendered at large. That's why you have in many of the standard forms of contracts an extension of time for any other breach by the employer. It's basically a save all provision. It enables the time mechanism in the contract and the damages con in the contract to be retained where there has been a problem caused by the employer. Now, whilst we have to have provisions for extension of time for events for which the employer is responsible, culpable, many contracts also have provisions for extensions of time for events which aren't the employer's fault at all. The prime example is exceptionally adverse weather conditions. You cannot say the employer is responsible for the weather. Yet, in many contracts, JCT and NEC, the employer nevertheless is held responsible for any delay associated by the weather. We have in the JCT and NEC other provisions dealing with events which the employer is not responsible for, for example, um, statutory undertakers, nothing to do with them, whether a statutory undertaker has failed or otherwise. 
um, antiquities, finding things that you couldn't foresee, like newts. So we have a number of events which the employer is not responsible for, but which has caused a delay, and the contractor is nevertheless entitled to an extension of time. However, in some contracts, they also provide for the contractor to recover loss and expense. And let's turn back to exceptionally adverse weather conditions. If we've entered into a JCT form of contract and we are delayed by exceptionally adverse weather conditions, then the contractor is entitled to an extension of time, but is not entitled to the recovery of any loss and expense and or damages. The reason is, is it is not the employer's fault and because the contract doesn't include exceptionally adverse weather conditions as a relevant matter, there is, in, there is no entitlement to the contractor. We can now compare that with my other favorite form, the NEC. The NEC, by contrast, has exceptionally adverse weather conditions as a compensation event. And of those of you who have been involved in NEC, you will be aware that when one deals with compensation events, the contractor is entitled not only to time, but to money as well. So let's just emphasize this. If you're on a project and it rains excessively heavily beyond what one would expect for that time of year based upon the records of the last 10 years, if you've entered it into a JCT contract, you're going to get time. If you've entered into an NEC contract, you're going to get time and money. I know which one I prefer. However, do be aware we have the Z options which can amend the contract. And I have seen accepting adverse weather conditions being omitted entirely or that you can only recover time. But the important point to identify is in these contracts, where there is an event for which the employer is responsible, not only do they provide for time, they provide for the recovery of money. Now under JCT, we have the terminology of loss and or expense, but do be aware that your common rights are retained. So what are your common rights, common law rights? Your common law rights is the entitlement to recover damages for breach. In other words, you can claim the loss you've incurred as a consequence of the employer's failure. Why might you seek to recover damages rather than loss and or expense? The reason is, is that you may have not complied with the notice requirements or other requirements whereby you're forced to claim for common law damages rather than loss and expense. But do be aware your recovery under the common law is generally going to be less than under the contract. The other major benefit of claiming under the contract is the contract stipulates how it's to be dealt with, with the CA, the architect, the project manager, having the authority to deal with it. And it provides for the issue of certificates and the inclusion of such amounts within those certificates. So there is a great benefit of having your comment, uh, having the right to loss and expense under the contract. But do notice that the provisions for extension of time and those for loss and expense are completely separate. They are different clause numbers. Everybody seems to link under the JCT the, the extension of time provisions and the loss and expenses if they are to be considered together. They are not. So do consider that under the JCT, you have to issue notices, but those notices should be separate and different when dealing with extension of time and loss and expense. Also do not do note that not all the relevant events have a corresponding relevant matter. So there are events, as I've mentioned, except the adverse weather conditions where you're entitled to time and not money. I do remember when I was on site, our idea was you only ever claimed for weather if you couldn't find any event with a corresponding relevant matter. Um, but equally, I'm aware of many disputes by contractors where the employer or their architect, CAPM, 
has issued an extension of time for exceptionally adverse weather conditions and therefore said, sorry, Mr. Contractor, you therefore have no entitlement to loss and expense. Is that right? Well, the answer is no, it's not, because what you're granted an extension of time for has got nothing to do with whether you're entitled to loss and expense. It's got some evidence, but let's just give a prime example. We're in a situation where we have two critical paths on a contract. Path one is the internal finishing works, which are going to take the longest because there's a lot of work to be done internally. But the external works is simply some repointing, which is covered by a provisional sum. The provisional sum is instructed and we set up and put up all the scaffolding to be able to carry out the repointing. But the architect keeps changing their mind and issuing more and more instructions for repointing. Our scaffolding is now kept on site for much longer. And as we're waiting for instructions, it's just standing there. We're not using it efficiently. We've got loads of resources standing around waiting to see what's going on. What should they be doing? The pointers, etc. Now the point is, is this has not delayed the works. It's not a critical path item. So you're not entitled to an extension of time. But why should you not recover loss and expense? You have been delayed. The works have been disrupted and you have incurred additional preliminary costs. So you're entitled to recover it. So despite not having been issued with any extension of time for, uh, for an event with a corresponding relevant matter, you can still recover loss and expense. The aim of issuing extensions of time is simply to extend the completion date to prevent damages, liquidated damages and time being rendered at large. So if you are awarded an extension of the time for exceptionally adverse weather conditions, which you do not agree with, simply write back and say, we don't agree that this is the relevant event and we will nevertheless be claiming loss and expense for the relevant matter being whatever it is. Now, the next thing is, is that loss and expense under the JCT form is based upon the actual cost. In other words, what it costs you what you have actually spent or are liable to spend in the future. I'll come back to that in a moment. As we've mentioned under the NEC, we don't have relevant events and relevant matters and variations. We only have one thing, which is compensation events. And this covers a whole load of events, including exceptional adverse weather conditions, variations, otherwise known as changes to the works information, late information, and a lot of these are timed to the accepted program. Importantly, when you're dealing with compensation events, there is an obligation upon the contractor to submit quotations. Those quotations have two elements. They have an assessment of what you think the cost will be, and what you forecast with the delay will be. But unlike JCT, they are forecast. And if they're forecast, they're not actually what you will incur. They can be substantially more than you actually incur or substantially less than you actually incur if you've underpriced it. And indeed, when pricing compensation events, you are entitled to price your risk. Now, for those of you who have dealt with the NEC through the various editions, will know that it was originally called forecast actual cost. Um, I'm very pleased they've changed it. It was never actual cost, albeit the term was a definition and it didn't mean actual cost. We've now got forecast defined cost and we use a schedule of cost components to assess what additional expenditure we will incur based upon a forecast. And there are heads of claim that we can claim for. So what we've identified is, is that under a contract, we can A, dictate how the loss and expense is to be assessed and ring fence it effectively, or we can leave it to simply represent what is the actual loss that has been incurred and has to be proved you can see the benefits of each. 
for the employer, if you ring fence it, you dictate that they've got to use compensation events and schedule of cost components, there's a greater degree of certainty. But there is risk. It may well be that what you pay out is substantially more than the actual cost that the contractor has incurred, or equally, and quite often the case, substantially less. It's because of this situation that quite often compensation events aren't agreed as the progress of, as, as the works progress. Now, the next really relevant point is the issue of notices. Most standard forms require the contractor to submit a notice and the information that needs to be provided within that notice will depend upon the form. I'm gonna deal with, as before, JCT and NEC. Let's deal with NEC, much which is much easier to explain. Under the NEC, the contractor is obliged to issue a compensation event notice for any event they think is a compensation event. And they've got to issue it within a set period stipulated in the contract from when they knew or ought to have known of the existence of that compensation event. Now, that does create some uncertainty. If you have exceptionally adverse weather conditions, because there is more rain, when do you issue the notice? Because you might find that you have more rain in one day than you would normally expect, or more rain than you would have expected in a month, or it may be that it's the issue of the winds. Number of facts, when do you suddenly assess it and when do you issue the notice? And is it just one event or is it gonna be a whole load of events across the contract? That's just one example. So my advice to contractors is I would issue a list of perceived compensation events possibly every week saying what you believe could be compensation events. Now the contract does say you're meant to issue these notices separately, but the reality is no one does it and where contractors do, more often the employer says you're being far too claims conscious, please stop. But under the NEC, you are obliged to issue a compensation event notice. And if you don't issue it within the constraints required by the contract, you lose your entitlement. What's more, unlike the JCT form, there is no common law rights. So no notice of compensation events, no entitlement. That is, however, subject to one caveat. And the NEC says, NEC says that the contractor will not lose their entitlement where the project manager should have issued a compensation event notice. So the question is, is when should the PM issue the compensation event notice? And the contract says every time they issue a change to the works information. So the project manager is not obliged to issue a compensation event notice where there is exceptionally adverse weather conditions, where there has been the late issue of information, where access has not been given in accordance with the date stated in the contract data, or if later shown on the contractor's accepted program. The PM doesn't have to do it. I would question whether he's acting in a spirit of mutual trust and cooperation, but according to the contract, the PM is not obliged to issue a compensation event notice. It follows that the contractor has to, and if the contractor fails to do so within the time prescribed, they lose their entitlement, say for work changes to the works information. We have a further obligation under the NEC, and that is to issue early warning notices. And again, a failure by the contractor to issue an early warning notice may possibly reduce their entitlement. What the NEC says is that where the, the contractor has failed to issue an early warning notice, the assessment of the relevant compensation event is to be assessed if he had issued the notice. Seems very strange. So in other words, if the contractor fails to issue an early warning notice, the compensation event is to be assessed as if he had. 
What the meaning of this is, is let's just say that there is a lack of information, which is a clear failure by the employer. And it causes an initial week worth of delay. The architect or the, the, the PM then becomes aware of this problem. And he then issues the information which causes another week's delay. So there is two weeks worth of delay. Had the contractor notified immediately of the problem by issuing early warning notice, the first week's worth of delay would have been avoided because the project manager could have issued the information immediately. It would still have caused a delay of one week, but the delay, the initial week would have been avoided. So under the NEC, the compensation event is to be assessed as, this, as if the contractor had given the notice. And therefore that first week will be lost. They will not be entitled to additional time or additional money associated with that week because of their failure to issue an early warning notice. Dealing with JCT, there is much dispute about whether or not the obligation to issue a loss and expense notice is a condition precedent. And the situation is it is not. The courts have looked into the issue of condition precedent and have cited two requirements for a notice to be considered a condition precedent. The first is that the contract should stipulate what needs to be issued and by when. So if a contract says it is a condition precedent that the contractor issue a notice within four weeks detailing X, Y, and Z, and if they fail to do so, they shall have no entitlement, that will work. But the JCT doesn't say that. The JCT says that the contractor shall issue notice as soon as it becomes reasonably apparent to it, et cetera, et cetera. It does not stipulate a period nor does it say that the contractor will lose their entitlement. It simply doesn't say that. So upon that basis, the loss and expense provision under the contract in JCT is not a condition precedent. By contrast, the NEC is because it does stipulate the period in which the notice has to be issued. And it does state that if you don't issue it, you lose your entitlement. Now, one of the things that is most common with loss and expense is global claims. A global claim. What is it? Um, it can take various forms. But what it is in effect is an amount of money that is not fully and properly particularised. So let's give an example. There are 10 delay events on a job and all of them are the employer's problem. And indeed, the contractor has been an awarded an extension of time for all of them, which is not disputed. The contractor then chooses to work out what his loss is, but without allocating it to the 10 separate events. What he simply says is, you've delayed me by this period of time, here is my total cost that I have incurred, which is additional and I want all of it. And what they've done is they've failed to link the events to the amounts being claimed. That is an obvious global claim, but quite often they can be even wider than that, where the contractor doesn't say what the cause of the delay, but simply cites 12 events and says, because of the 12 events, I've been delayed by 12 weeks. And because I've been delayed by 12 weeks, I seek liquidate, uh, seek um, loss in expense for 12 million pounds. There is no more information. Now the courts have said is that you can have global claims and we're going to come to that in a moment. But the concern is, is this is reversing the burden of proof because rather than the contractor having to prove what the loss is, in effect it is now the employer to disprove the entitlement. In other words, they've got to try and show that that amount is not recoverable. And it is for that reason, unsurprisingly, that employers don't like it. Now the courts have said you are allowed to do it subject to certain caveats, and we're gonna go through that. 
Now, the important case remains the good old water lily versus Mr. McKay. And the interesting point, if you read the case law, is to, to actually look into Justice Aikenhead's judgment. And he says that Walter Lilly's claim as advanced was not a global claim. Mr. McKay and DM Developments argued it was, but the court said it was not. And the reason was, was that Walter Lilly's case actually identified what were the delays what were the events and what were the periods of delay associated with the events? They then allocated against each of their events what they deemed to be the loss and expense caused by each. And they were properly linked. And therefore, the claim as advanced was not a global claim. But the court at that time took the opportunity to actually deal with the issue of global claim. And what they said is that you can, subject to what the contract provides, claim by way of a global claim. But there are certain evidential burdens that the contractor has to meet. If they don't meet these obligations, then they can't recover anything. So what they've got to do is to actually establish that the reason for the delay or a disruption was caused by events which entitle it to loss and expense. So let's give an easy example. We've got a job we're meant to be completed today. We're not going to complete for another two weeks because of additional works and late information. We need to show that it was those events that caused the delay and disruption. And we can therefore show that these are events for which the employer is responsible and culpable. And they have, as a matter of fact, caused both the delay and disruption. And they've caused us to incur, as a result, the loss and expense. What we simply haven't done is to allocate all that loss and expense against each and every one of the events. We've done a rolled up or global claim. We've proved we were delayed by 10 weeks. We've proved that that delay of 10 weeks was caused by events which entitled us to loss and expense. And we've proved what the loss and expense we've incurred was by those 10 events. We've now ticked the boxes to advance a global claim. But what the court said is, is you've got to comply with any contractual restrictions. And the prime example is the NEC because it doesn't allow global claims. It says that the contractor's only entitlement to recovery for additional money or additional time is through the compensation event mechanism. So you cannot run a global claim under NEC. Now I've had so many contractors over the years come to me and say, we've got a claim under the NEC, we've got 50 events, that we value, but because of discussions with the project manager, we've got one claim for the overall prolongation. The NEC doesn't allow that. So we're now into um, issues of estoppel and waiver and other arguments why the terms of the contract that the parties have entered into are no longer applicable. And this is, to be honest, a common problem. The amount of times I've been either representing a party or acting as an adjudicator where the parties have simply not followed the contract. It's my view, with respect to all of you that are listening, under most contracts, people don't read the contract and they don't follow it as they should. But the NEC is the least followed. It is very prescriptive of what you should do and when. And the parties simply don't follow it. I'll give you an example. Where we have an instruction, which is a change to the works information, the project manager should issue an instruction. They should issue separately an early warning notice and a request for an early warning meeting. Separately, they should also issue a compensation event notice and separately a request for the contractor to submit a quotation. Where the PM has failed to do so, the contractor should issue an early warning notice separately to a compensation event notice 
and then subsequently issuing a compensation event assessment, fully backed up with the breakdown from the scheduler cost components and with a complete revised program for acceptance showing the delay. And that should happen for each and every compensation event. Now on a big project, how many compensation events do you get per day, let alone for the duration of the works? I mean, I've been involved in jobs where they've had 10 or 11 compensation events an hour. And you're meant to issue all that paperwork. I even knew a contractor who did it. And the employer actually asked the contractor's site manager to be removed from site because he was too aggressive, too contractual, when all he was doing was following what the contract said. But under NEC, except for where there has been some form of waiver or estoppel, the contractor cannot run a global claim. Now, as far as the way you can advance a global claim, the court said it's dependent upon the contractor's own choice. He can do it however he likes. He can, by way of example, rely upon witness statements. All he's got to do is to meet the three elements I addressed earlier and to show on the balance of probability that he's right. And let's deal with balance of probability. The easiest way of explaining it is you've got to get over 50%. You've got to show it's more likely than not. And you can do it in any format you like, the court said. But what the, the court said was that there were evidential difficulties in running a global claim by a contractor. What they said was, is that they had to prove that the loss they were claiming had been incurred by the events. And therefore they had to show they were not recover or seeking to recover monies that they were not entitled to. And one prime example, or two prime examples of that are A, underpricing within their tender. So if you simply say our original um, contract value was 1 million, we've spent 2 million, so we want 1 million, it's very possible that the 1 million overspend could have been caused in part by your underpricing of your tender. So you're going to have to show that you are not recovering that. The best way is to show what you allowed within your tender and then say if and why you under allowed and then increase your tender allowance so that your baseline includes for what you would have incurred but for the event, and then take the remainder from it. The next problem is with global claims is if you say there have been 10 events and they've caused you to incur 10 million pound, if I can show that you have no entitlement in regards to one of those events, and we can't separate out the loss associated with the event, the whole thing topples. So what if, if I'm looking to defend an employer, what I'm going to try and do is to show, A, that they are claiming the contractor for losses that really are underpricing in their tender, and also certain elements of their additional cost has been caused by things that are not the employer's fault, not least defective work or delays for which the contractor has no entitlement, except in the adverse weather condition, delays by statutory undertakers. And it will therefore be the obligation of the contractor to show what the loss is attributable to those events for which they have no entitlement so they can deduct those. If they can't do it, the whole lot falls down. Turning back to what the court said, they said that there is absolutely no problem if the contract allows for you to deal with a global claim dealing with a whole series of events or factors. But the problem is if what, there is an event which is also attributable, attributed to the loss and the employer is not responsible for it, as I've just mentioned, the whole lot will fail. The court said that, you know, you do not go through, need to go through cause and effect and you can run with a global claim. But if you do so, the court should be suspicious. Why are you doing it? Why are you not choosing to do proper cause and effect? So there will be scepticism as to the contractor's reason for doing it. 
Now, the traditional reason is, is, well, it was simply impossible. And I've been in jobs where it's been impossible. I've been involved in projects where contractors are building a new hundred million pound house. And the employer is changing everything as it's being built. It's a nightmare of a job. I've been on jobs involved on rail lines where you start exposing areas and you find something completely different than what's on all the drawings. And it's an absolute nightmare again. And there are so many different areas of work open and everything's being varied and changed. And to try and show a proper critical analysis of all the delays of which are dominant, and which are concurrent, and which are secondary, is virtually impossible. So therefore, you are forced to do a global claim and the courts will be more sympathetic. But the problem is, is contractors seek to advance global claims on all jobs. And quite often, there's no reason to do it. Now, I recognise, and indeed in my past I did it, that people run global claims because they intend to negotiate their way out of it. They're going to put forward a nice big global claim, and I've spoken to many employers said, well, it's really easy to assess the contractor's true entitlement, get the figure they've claimed, divide it by four, then divide it by four again, and you'll probably get where their true entitlement is. Um, but I recognise, you know, if you don't have to do full cause and effect, why would you? If you can put together a global claim and get to a negotiated settlement with the employer, why would you not do that? But be mindful that where you don't do it and then you seek to advance the claim through some form of dispute resolution, adjudication, arbitration or litigation, if you can't justify why you've done a global claim, you're going to find it far more difficult to gain a recovery. And I just emphasize this, this is the Society of Construction Laws Delay Protocol. And what they've said is, is that where a global claim is not advanced, is advanced, but it is impossible to break it down and to take out amounts which are non-recoverable, it is possible that the adjudicated judge or CA may therefore reject the whole claim. Now, the important point is, in most contracts, except the NEC, but in most contracts, the whole reason of having loss and expense is to recover your loss. What you've been incurred to, you've incurred by reason of the employer's responsibility or culpability and for events which the contractor entitles you, the contract entitles you to recover. Put another way, what you're effectively showing is, but for this event, we would not have incurred this loss. I'm just gonna re-emphasize this. But for the event, we would not have incurred this loss. So there's two bits there. One is we've incurred a loss. And number two is, is we wouldn't have incurred the loss, but for the event. I've seen a claim only in the last couple of days where the contractor has put it together for me to look at. And the first thing I see is he's added profit. It's a JCT form. You're not entitled to recover profit on your loss and expense claim. Why not, he said. But I said, well, that's not what loss and expense is. Loss and expense is to put yourself back in the position you would have been. You wouldn't have obtained this profit. You've not lost anything. There is no profit. The other thing is, is and we're going to come to this in a moment, the issue of overheads and profit. And I said to him, you know, we're going to deal with Hudson Formula in a moment, but you're telling me you've incurred all these overheads, you know, your head office and everything else. And I asked him, so if this job had not gone on, you would have closed your head office then? No, he says. So I said, well, would you have not incurred this head office overheads, whatever they are? Well, yes, but surely they've got to pay something. And that's the problem. Many contractors, when looking at loss and expense, think it's an opportunity to make more money, to increase their profitability. Whereas under the JCT, what we're actually looking to do is to reimburse you for the loss you've incurred, so as to put you back in the position you would have been, but for the breach. Now, if that's right, and it is right, what we're actually looking at is the loss you've incurred at the time the event occurred. 
And this is key. And what is often asked of me, and I get involved in no end of disputes along this line, is we're going to produce a loss and expense claim. How should we do it? And the starting point is, is I would suggest to you, you should in theory be dealing with the delays first. And what you want to do is to produce a program showing what was the original intention and what would have occurred if there had been no delays. What you then do is use what is called as time slice analysis or window analysis is to produce a program every month or let's say every week or every date an event impacts the program. So you're gonna have a whole series of programs showing when things occur. So let's give, give you an example. The first month, everything has gone well. And we're doing a retrospective delay analysis here. The first month, everything is going fine. The progress reports and issued at the end of the month show everything's on program. Next month, however, we show that we're three weeks behind. So we issue our baseline program, but with the progress percentages input and a calculate now, which shows a drop down line now is showing you where you are to program and also ultimately shows that you've lost in the month two weeks. And we can also see in the period of this month, which events have caused which delays, what delays should have progressed and haven't. We can actually look at the program and see, oh, in this month, right, we should have done 60% of brickwork, we've only done 30%. And we should have started this activity, but we haven't. So you can actually identify in the month what has gone wrong. What you then do is to try and establish what has caused that problem. And you can say, okay, the reason why the brickwork didn't proceed is because we didn't have all the information for setting out from the employer, and this caused us the delay. Or there was an instruction required on a particular information, which wasn't there, and that caused us the delay. So what we've been able to identify in month two is there's been a two week delay and the delay was to the brickwork and the reason for it was late information and we can also identify what event it is it is late information stroke additional work and we can also see that it knocks on the job end by two weeks and we continue with that process all the way to completion we now look at our lot loss and expense and we go back to month two and we see we've lost two weeks and equally we can see that two weeks has been knocked on and caused ultimately two weeks to the end of the job. But we claim the preliminaries and additional costs we incurred in that month. So what we do is we look at our original baseline program and we allocated the resources that would have been allocated if things had gone to plan. And then we allocate the true resources and we look to take one from another. Now, it may be the case because there is a clear critical delay that you can claim most of the prelims because let's say there's no work going on. But what you're going to do is to show that the costs that have been incurred in that window are additional by showing the additional resources being expended or the resources that are being used at this time but are inefficiently. So effectively the job has been prolonged. Now, to give you an example of why this process is right, Let's just say that this problem with the brickwork was as a consequence of late information and we've got the whole building scaffolding down and we can't use that scaffolding. If we claim our loss and expense based upon the period of prolongation, the scaffolding was not even on site. But if we claim it in the right window, we're going to pick up the loss and expense at the right time. And what we've got to try and show is, is that, that those resources that have been expended were caused by that event. And but for that event, we would not have incurred them. Now, the best thing to support such a claim will be time records, time sheets produced at the time, ideally signed or issued. Photographs will very much support it as well. We want all those records made available if possible. That is the ideal world. Now, one issue that has often comes up, and indeed, I think one of the questions that was posted fairly recently was the issue of concurrency. And the issue of concurrency is not an easy one. 
And let me start off by saying the concurrency is dealt with differently in Scotland when compared to England. In England, where there is an issue of concurrency, the contractor is generally entitled to extension of time for the full period. But in Scotland, there can be an apportionment. So the position is different in Scotland than compared in England. But the biggest issue is, is that more often than not, there is no concurrency because people with respect refer to concurrency wrongly. We have concurrent events and concurrent effects. A concurrent event is one that occurs at the same time. So to give you an example, today we were meant to commence the brickwork, but the bricklayers have gone into receivership, so there's no people on site. Today, we would have commenced the brickwork if there were people on site, but we've got no information for the employer, so therefore we don't even know what we're meant to build, so we can't progress today. And today there's a hurricane, so even if we had the information and had the people on site, we couldn't have done it because the weather wouldn't really permit it. They've all occurred today. They are all therefore concurrent events. But what is the case if that is the situation, save for the contractors, bricklayer, went into receivership a week ago and the, the contractor has not been able to procure another brick working subcontractor? The situation is, is that the, they are not concurrent. They did not happen at the same time, but their effects are now concurrent today. They are concurrent effects, not concurrent events. And there's an important case, it's called Saga. I can't remember the full title. But what the courts basically did was to look at certain delays. And what they decided was, was that an earlier employer contractor delay subsumed all the later delays. So in other words, the contractor caused the delay initially and he was not going to complete for another 20 weeks late. And hence there was a 10 weeks delay, let's say. Subsequent to that delay, the employer then issued some instructions that didn't ultimately delay the works, but also caused the contractor or would have caused the contractor to complete 10 weeks late. The question is, is the contractor entitled to an extension of time? And the court said, no, because the earlier delay was the contractor's, and was the key and critical delay. It, there were no concurrent delays. That was the first delay, and the contractor is not entitled to extensions of time. So the general rule is that when looking into delays, when they impacted the program will be relevant and may dictate, because one event happened much earlier, that subsequent delays are not concurrent and contractor either may lose or may have entitlement notwithstanding those later delays. We've dealt with prolongation and thickening costs on how to do it. Disruption should be dealt with in the same way. What you should be identifying on the programme is what resources would have been deployed if the job had not been delayed, and then what were the actual resources based upon actual records, and to show that the additional resources being deployed were caused by the relevant event, and was not due to any under allowance or because of defective works or otherwise. You need to prove that they're being caused by the event for which the employer is culpable. Last thing I want to deal with is the marvelous Hudson's Ebden's Eichlick's formula. You have a claim for half a million. Job was delayed by 10 weeks. You then apply Hudson's or Emden's formula and your now claim is 10 billion. It's fantastic. It shows these massive sums being entitled to. And the question is, can you use the formulas? Yes, you can. But are you entitled to the amount of money? Not necessarily. When you're dealing with loss of overhead and profit, you've got to show that but for the event, you would have not incurred the loss. So in other words, what you're trying to prove is, is you're claiming something that you would have obtained a lost opportunity, but for the delay. And what you're saying is, is if this job had not been prolonged for 10 weeks, all those resources could have been on another job, earning me overheads and profit. And therefore I've lost 
that opportunity. I've lost that overhead and profit that would have been recovered on this other job. How are you going to prove that? Two things. Number one is you're going to show me all the tenders you submitted that you lost because you either either priced them purposely or you chose not to tender at all because you didn't have the resources to undertake this further job. The second thing you might do is, or should do, is to show me that in this period, you therefore reduced your profitability as a company. You're going to show that because this job was going, you lost money. You didn't make the same level of profit in previous months and years. Now, the case that allowed Hudson's formula to be applied was a contractor who only ever did one job at a time. And because he hadn't finished job one, he couldn't move on to job two. So therefore, it was very easy for him to show he'd lost the opportunity because he hadn't started his second job. And therefore, they said, no problem, use Hudson's formula. But most contractors, that's not the situation. They don't work on one job. And if a job comes, they'll do is employ additional resources, not turn down the job. That's what you'll need to prove. Okay, Julie, any questions? As you would expect, there are indeed. Um, first question, from what you said, it appears that it will be near impossible for a contractor to get a loss in expense or profit loss. Um, the person who's writing said they were involved on a job that had cladding replacement and the contractor got loss of profit. Was this right? Yeah, that you, you are definitely entitled to loss of, well, loss of profit, seems a strange statement. I don't know if they mean loss of overheads and profit. Loss of profit means that you haven't done something that you would have obtained profit on. So for example, you can get a loss of profit where under the contract you were entitled to do certain works and they're omitted. You would get a, lay, a loss of profit claim. So in simple quick answer to the question, you can get loss of profit if you can show A, there was a breach and B, because of that breach, you lost profit. But if you can't prove it, you can't get it. So I've been involved in various disputes, being a adjudicator, arbitrator, or a representative, where a contractor has recovered loss of overheads and profit, but they've had to prove it. Okay. Um, in the case of liquidated damages, where pre or a predetermined amount is given, does the loss still have to be both reasonable and proved? Um, the writer saying they understood that you'd always said this was the case for general damages. Well, they seem to be mixing their words there, general damages and liquidated damages, one or the other. So number one is, for liquidated damages, they must be a genuine and reasonable pre-estimate put into the contract at the time the contract was entered into. So when the contract was entered into, We've done a reasonable and genuine for estimate and thought our loss would be 10K. We don't have to prove what our loss is. Our loss could be 100K, it could be one penny. We can still claim 10K because it was a genuine and reasonable pre-estimate. So liquidated damages, do you need to prove? No. The only thing that can happen is the contractor can prove that the liquidated damages were not a genuine and reasonable pre-estimate and thereby get rid of them. But the employer does not have to prove them. Okay. Um, as a mid-size employer and contractor, what frequency as a contractor is reasonable to submit extension of time claims? Okay, the term claim is an unusual one. Most contracts do not require you to submit claims. They require you to submit notices. And that's what you've got to do. So you submit notices as required by the contract. So the contract, JCT by way of example, says as soon as it becomes reasonably apparent, the contractor shall. Well, that's what you've got to do. You should issue a notice of extension of time as soon as it becomes reasonably apparent the works are going to be delayed. You should set down the circumstances and you should set down whether you think it's a relevant event and you should set down what you think the delay is. And the rule I generally say is, is when issuing a notice of extension of time, ideally give it to your mum. And if your mum understands it, you can say, I understand it fully, but it's suitable. If she doesn't, then it's no good. Because do remember, the person you're submitting your notice to probably knows what has caused the delay and is denying it because it's their fault. 
So don't work on the basis that they know, because that doesn't help you. You're looking to prove it to a third party some months down the line who knows nothing about the job, for example, me. So I want to look at that notice and go, you don't have to tell me anything. It makes perfect sense to me. It should read along the lines of, on Monday, as, as per our original construction program, we were due to commence brickwork on the 1st of January. Along lines of this, two weeks before, we requested the following information, but the information was not forthcoming and therefore we could not start. The information was finally issued seven days on the 8th of January, representing a seven day delay. And we were therefore able to start that day. The delay therefore is seven days. And that's a very simple example, but that's the nature of the information you need. Because as I often say, when I get involved with claims of extension of time, they go down to site and say, that's great, Mr. Sian, can you tell me what's gone on in the past? What's caused the delay? Most of them say, I don't know, mate, I've only just joined. Because everybody's done a runner and therefore nobody knows what's gone on. So that's what you should be doing with the notice. Loss and expense, again, it depends on what the contract says. Loss and expense, again, you should be stating what is the relevant matter, the details and why you've incurred a loss. By reason of the delay to the brickwork, as referred to in our letter above or our letter of, of today's date, the effect is, is that We've now had bricklayers standing on site for one day, these C day work sheets attached, unable to commence any works. Further, there's been the following preliminary costs, which have been expended in that there is a critical delay of one week. And you sit down and explain what is the resources that have been expended and what is the cost. And again, you should be able to give it to your mum so they understand it. What then happens is, more often than not, the CA, the PM, the architect then thinks, oh dear, that makes me look good. I want to try and avoid this. So they ask for endless information and they deny anything. They don't certify anything. They don't pay you anything. The problem then is, is you then need to go to potentially adjudication or at the very least put the employee in a position where he says, I better pay them because if they do go to adjudication, we will lose. So you therefore produce a claim. My advice to you is do not wait to the end of job to produce the claim. Produce it contemporaneously. And also do recognise, particularly under the JCT, that many of your claim items can be included within the valuation of the variation and not as a global claim or as a claim of loss and expense. So, for example, if you've got scaffolding standing for longer, include it within the valuation of the variation. Include elements of prelims within the variation claim because you are entitled to. That's what the JCT says. So in answer, when should you produce the claim? As contemporaneous as you can with all the full records. Okay, that's great. That seems to be the uh, end of the question, unless anyone else wishes to ask anything else. Uh, as we said earlier, if there's something you don't particularly wish to ask in an open forum, please email Richard, richardsilver at silverllp.com. You can see his email address in the background there. That concludes this evening's seminar. Uh, we have had some Zoom issues tonight, so if you did experience any of those, my apologies. Um, we will be back next week, uh, Wednesday again. We have in the morning John Sharp with Professional Indemnity Insurance and Design Negligence Post Grenfell. And in the evening, we have the latest with uh, in Mohammed Hack's series, Adjudication Matters, where he's talking about do's and don'ts. We also have on Thursday the property roundup uh, with guests from various organizations. There'll be more news of that coming out on social media shortly. So thank you everyone for your time. Thank you for your questions, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care. Thank, thank you, you Richard.